Where were they heading in this episode? Was this story a metaphor for Stephen Reese's creative process? Did the papers on the floor have a hidden message? We'll be looking at these questions and more in this video. Welcome to Square Rides, a channel where we recap, review and take a sideways look at your favourite TV programmes. This video is about the fifth episode of the ninth and final series of Inside Number 9, called The Curse of the Ninth. Let's jump straight into the recap. The episode starts with Nathaniel Burnham agonising over a symphony he's composing. Then we see a flash of a figure creeping up behind him, but when he jumps up to confront it, they've vanished, suggesting that he's gone mad. He then seems to finish writing his symphony, pull a gun from a drawer, point it at a door, then turn it on himself and pull the trigger. Which is a shame, because I like Eddie Marzan, I was hoping he'd at least make it past the opening credits. But nope, he's dead before we even see the title card. In the next scene, we see Devonshire, the maid, open the door to the country house to Jonah Quigley, the nervy piano tuner. He's very impressed by the piano he's come to tune, and even more so when he discovers that it used to belong to Nathaniel Burnham. He gets this information from Burnham's widow, who does not seem nearly as interested in her late husband's musical achievements. However, Jonah had been a keen student of Burnham and talks about his love for his music, and how he had his own aspirations to be a composer, which he never fulfilled, so he became a piano tuner instead. When Jonah starts tuning the piano, he notices that some of the bum notes are a result of a piece of paper being stuffed in the instrument. It's a piece of sheet music. He immediately takes it to Mrs. Burnham, who is entertaining her lawyer, Dickie. It's an unperformed piece of Burnham's ninth and final symphony. Dickie then explains to Jonah the concept of the Curse of the Ninth, which is a common belief that a composer will die after writing their ninth symphony. Many famous composers have died after completing their ninth. Nathaniel Burnham was composing his ninth shortly before his death, and was gripped with the fear of the curse. It was this fear that drove him to madness and led to him shooting himself in the head. Burnham wanted his unfinished symphony to be buried with him, so it's currently six feet under, despite the fact he would be of enormous interest to the music-loving world. As Jonah is packing up, Devonshire, the maid, gives him a key to get into the tradesman's entrance, which also gives access to the garden where Burnham is buried, and drops some heavy-handed hints about how to access a shovel, and how easy it will be to dig up the grave to remove the symphony. It takes Jonah a while, but eventually picks up on what she's hinting at. Despite his obvious reservations, Jonah returns to the garden that night, and we see him outside while Devonshire is trying to hurry Mrs. Burnham through her puzzle and rush her up to bed. Then we see Jonah digging up Nathaniel Burnham's grave and prizing the symphony from his skeleton. Devonshire then appears and takes the symphony away from him, intending to sell it to the highest bidder. Jonah is unhappy about it, as he is more concerned about preserving it as a piece of musical history, rather than making profit. Jonah tells her that he wants to be the first to conduct the piece, but Devonshire puts him in his place and tells him that it could be their ticket out of their lowly positions. The disagreement ends with raised voices and Jonah smashing Devonshire around the face with a spade. He throws her into the grave and starts filling it in. The blow wasn't fatal, but he buries her alive anyway, which is pretty brutal. Some time has passed in the next scene when we see Jonah Quigley invited back to the country house with Lillian Burnham greeting guests herself now Devonshire is no longer around. Dickie and Mrs Burnham know that Jonah killed Devonshire, and have invited him back to bribe him into completing the symphony. Jonah just wants to give it back to them, as he believes having it in his possession is making him ill. Dickie and Lillian are keen for him to complete the symphony, and while he fears the curse, he has no option, as they will report him for Devonshire's murder if he refuses. Then we see a frantic seeming Jonah, working on the symphony and talking to Burnham's bust. Only we then see it's not his bust he's talking to, it's Burnham himself, or a vision of him, that is sat by the fire giving him instructions. Burnham taunts Quigley, and it's only when he moves the bust out of the room that Quigley is able to get the work done. The next morning, Jonah is asleep at his desk when Lillian comes into the study, but the work has been finished. However, with a magician's sleight of hand, Jonah has left a page out of the symphony, and hands it over for Lillian to add in, making her the person to complete the symphony, and therefore the person who is in line to become the victim of the curse. She realises too as she closes the portfolio, despite what she says about not believing in curses. Mrs Burnham then goes upstairs and some sort of figure jumps out and shocks her, prompting her to fall backwards over the banister and onto her neck in the hallway below, killing her instantly, leaving Jonah able to collect up the symphony for himself, free of the curse. When the credits rolled on this episode, I felt a little bit underwhelmed. The previous four episodes left a stronger impression on me, and this one didn't have the same impact. But then again, I think it was just a slow-burning type of enjoyment that it offered. The pleasure of this episode was more subtle, such as the beautiful score, the set design, and the attention to detail, understated by exceptional performances and tight storytelling. It's satisfying, but it doesn't exactly grab you and shake you by the shoulders. So the more I sit back and think about it, the more I like it, even if my first feeling was that it was a bit average. It probably wasn't helped by the fact that the ending didn't deliver a huge twist or perspective shift in the same way that every other episode has this series. I suppose Jonah tricking Lillian into adding this final page of the symphony was the twist, but by inside number 9 standards this is fairly mild, and we've become accustomed to huge moments at the end of episodes that completely shift the perspective of the whole story. Like in last week's episode where we found out that the whole escape room was a metaphor for a dying man's coma. Then again, if all you ever do is huge twists, I suppose they can start to feel like gimmicks, and this episode was fine without it, as long as you weren't expecting one to come. 
So maybe the bigger problem was my expectation rather than the storytelling itself. One slight quibble I had with this episode was the location. Inside number 9 always focuses on a single location to create a kind of claustrophobia in the episodes, regardless of the subject or setting. But a country house and the ground just feels a bit too vast to have that kind of tightly packed feeling that is otherwise universal in Inside Number 9. I don't know how they could have achieved it, but I think this story may have benefited from painting on a smaller canvas and creating a more trapped in kind of feeling. I feel like a gush about the acting in every video about Inside Number 9, but I really enjoyed the guest actors in this episode, particularly Natalie Dormer, who has a real skill for communicating a lot by not doing very much. Just restraining movements or gestures from her can give away a lot about her character. Eddie Marzan had a disappointingly short amount of screen time but I feel like he made the most of the scenes that he was in. He really embodied the role of the tortured artist, and brought the kind of intensity that was needed, though he's never been short of intensity throughout his career when he's on screen. I don't think I've ever seen him being anything but great in all the things that he does, and this part was no different even if it was only a fleeting role. I particularly love the creepy way he just appeared in the background when it looked like Jonah was talking to a statue, but he was really talking to a corpse. If I'm honest, I'm not really a fan of Edwardian chillers, as this episode was described as, so I'm not that well qualified to comment on how well it did as paying tribute to this genre. Having said that, it seemed like a well-observed period piece. The pacing, the performances and the setting, it all felt like the right kind of thing. And they still managed to get some silly jokes in too, which is more up my street. I think The Curse of the Ninth was an interesting subject matter for Inside Number 9 to tackle. I think this investigation into the creative process and the personal costs it can take on your life may be relevant to the real-life creators of Inside Number 9. After all, this is the ninth and final series of the show, which is the television maker's nearest equivalent to a composer's symphony. I wonder if they too feel a burden of creating new material and how much it takes from them. But I doubt that either of them will fear that completing this last series will lead to a grisly end, as it did for both the Burnhams. I think making anything at a high standard for a consistent amount of time takes its toll, and this may have been their way of expressing that idea. Anyone that creates things will know that when you make something, it brings something new into the world, and that's a great feeling. But it takes something out of you too, and that's hard to put yourself through again and again. Which may be why the Curse of the Ninth exists. There's only so much that a creator can create. It also may be why Inside Number 9 is coming to an end. So it feels like this was a good choice of material for the penultimate episode of the series, as it was a meditation on the creator's creative process. It might not be an absolute classic, but it's a nicely observed episode, with plenty to enjoy if you pay enough attention to the details that have been so expertly attended to in this episode. I now hope that next week's final episode is an absolute belter so they can leave on a high. My favourite line in this episode was, It's Devonshire, which the maid shouts at Jonah after he's referred to her using the wrong name one too many times and she snaps. This prompts him to clonk her in the face with a spade and it sets in motion the events for the rest of the story. Jonah referring to Devonshire as various different English counties seemed to be quite an unfunny running joke, but it built and built over the episode to the point it became a key moment to the story, as it provided the catalyst for this moment of violence that the whole story hinges on. I like the way that silly jokes can actually end up becoming meaningful plot points inside number 9, as it shows how much care they put into the writing. The Curse of the Ninth is believed to have been started by Gustav Mahler in the late Romantic period, but there's a long list of composers on Wikipedia who are believed to have fallen victim to it, alongside Beethoven and Schubert, who were the famous names that gave Mailer the idea that the Ninth Symphony might be cursed. It's too long a list to read out, but here are the names on screen if you're interested in them. This isn't the first TV series to cover the Curse of the Ninth. There's an episode in the 16th series of Midsummer Murders named after the curse. A composer was strangled by a violin string, and then an antique violin was stolen from the crime scene. The curse provided an interesting distraction for the more financial motivation for the real killer, who was eventually brought to justice. The nearest modern equivalent of the Curse of the Ninth would be the 27 Club, which is a cultural phenomenon where musicians, actors, and celebrities of various types have a tendency to die at the age of 27. While it's not exactly scientific fact, there is a long list of entertainers who have died at this age in the last 50 years or so. I suppose, being boring and pragmatic, it's probably an age where people who got famous at a young age often find their high-risk lifestyles start to catch up with them, as the deaths of those in the 27 Club typically involve some sort of self-destructive element to them. Anyway, here's another list of the names of the notable members of this grizzly club. The hair in this episode was hidden behind a big vase about 26 minutes in, it's another one that you really have to pay attention to spot, as it's mostly in shadow, but it feels pretty obvious once you do notice it. One little easter egg that I noticed at the very end of the episode was that the papers on the floor that scattered around Mrs Burnham seemed to form a notable pattern. I might be overthinking it, but to me it looks like there's a distinctive number 9 that can be seen. The next episode is the final ever episode of Inside Number 9. Usually a poster is released in advance and a short description of the episode with a cast list, but for this one there's just the title, Podding On and it says that only Reese and Steve are in it, but I don't think I trust them, and they may just be keeping the other cast members secret. I suspect it'd be something a bit different and a bit special, with it being the last one. As Inside Number 9 has so often pushed boundaries and subverted expectations, it's hard to know what that could be. Maybe it'll be a sequel to a previous episode, a huge cast of guest actors, or some kind of twist on a clip show. It's hurting my head trying to guess, but I'm looking forward to it anyway. Thank you for watching. I'll be back next week with my video for the final episode. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. Goodbye.